Okay. Uh, November 28th, first of five days in a row that we're going to be going over. And the Israel Museum is the cultural center of the Jewish world. It's where all their art and cultural identity resides. That's one half of a 20 acre museum. It is a compound. It is a complex of buildings. The other half is archeology. span So art and archeology. span They have a six acre sculpture garden on the property. And what we're interested in is the biblical portion of the archeology span uh, portion of the museum. And uh, let's go ahead and get this off. There it is, 20 acres. 20 acre facility, uh, massive. We're gonna be dropped off in the morning and you can pace it at your own pace. I mean, you're there once in a lifetime. So figure out what you wanna see in advance. You wanna see the art and the culture, that's fine. It's all there. But if anything has been found in Israel, that ties biblically, uh, it's gonna be found here. They have found when they excavated along the temple wall, Herod's temple, uh, they removed all the blocks that the Romans had tumbled over and way down at the bottom, they found a pomegranate uh, that was um, made out of ivory. And on it was something like sacred to the Lord or whatnot. You go back in the Old Testament and the priests, high priests and the priest's garments had a fringe around their robes that were made out of pomegranates and bells. They alternated. So if you read your Old Testament passage, this is an actual item from the temple period. And it's one of the few that uh, have been found, if only. I mean, it, I remember when it was a big deal. Uh, in archeological circles. This uh, complex has all of this. You know, um, when we were digging down in Qumran and we were following a copper scroll treasure map and we were looking for a pot in the cave that we were directed to. And we found it two years later, we being the, the archeological dig director it's on display here in the Israel Museum. So you can see uh, a jar of anointing oil for the priesthood uh, back from the time of Christ, uh, 70 AD, when they hid it down in the caves of Qumran. Now, there are a couple things I wanna show you here. Uh, this area right here is fairly new to the museum, but it, it's something that I've seen since 84. Uh, the Holy Land Hotel created a 150th scale model of Jerusalem in the time of Christ. Now, I don't know why I didn't schedule us going to the Israel Museum first for the simple fact that uh, every place we're walking around Jerusalem you can fit uh, into your mind in looking on this uh, particular model, scale model of Jerusalem. There's something else here. This is called the Shrine of the Book. In Qumran, they found an Isaiah scroll. It was the most intact scroll of Isaiah ever found. And it pushed textual criticism back into time 1,000 years. In other words, 1000 AD was the oldest manuscript in existence up until they found this scroll uh, in Qumran and it's 40 feet long or what have you, but it's, it's beautiful. Oh, let's back up here. This building right here is not included in our admission price. It is called, but it's part of this complex, 
And by the way, anybody know what this building is here? Recognize that? That's the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, right there, real close, right across from uh, all of this complex here. This is the Bible Lands Museum. And uh, it's the only museum in the world dedicated to the history of the ancient Near East from a biblical worldview perspective. Okay, it's worth going to. Everything in it ties to tracing the roots of monotheism from the dawn of civilization to early Christianity. And it's done from a Christian perspective. So you um, are going to see the culture of the different timelines of the Bible and so on and so forth. You'll get the same thing in the Israel Museum, but you're going to get it from a secular uh, perspective. Uh, there is nothing biblical about biblical archaeology per se, other than it's somehow tied to the Bible. But there's a, several publications out there with the name biblical archaeology in them that have nothing to do with believing that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And they're all the time questioning what they find and questioning the Bible only to have them proven wrong time and time and time again. And we're gonna get to one of those instances today. Here's the shrine of the book. This is where the Isaiah scroll is. It's what, I mean, it's an archeo architectural oddity or uniqueness uh, in the shape of a clay pot that the scrolls were, were um, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the, the top of a lid of a scroll jar. And this is the interior of it. And there is the Isaiah scroll itself. And you can walk around and view it. Definitely a, an experience. Um, yeah. 66 chapters. <laughs> What's that? Um, I think so. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, here is that scale model. And you can see the door over here to give you an idea of the scale. Uh, there's a man. Up, no, that's not a man. Uh, but that door will six foot eight inches high. We are going to be visualizing this in the days before coming here. So that's why I'm saying it would have been nice to have been here first so that you know what you're walking through, what you're seeing. Um, the Pool of Siloam, the Spring of Gihon, way down here to the left is the Spring of Gihon. Uh, Pool of Siloam, uh, you can see the Cheesemakers Valley you're going to be walking up this underground, being dumped out up here along the Temple Mount wall. Um, here's the Antonio Fortress where Jesus was scourged up over here in this corner. Yeah. When the Romans... Uh, they, I think Herod built the temple and they, they built that, added onto it. Its purpose was to house a garrison so that if there's rioting on the church, I mean church, the temple mount. Yeah, uh, here, if you can envision it, was they left here, he left here bearing his cross, walked down the Via Della Rosa, the, the street right here, got help from Simon Cyrene, from Cyrene, and down here at this gate, 
uh, was crucified just outside the gate. This is where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is. Okay. The garden tomb is up here, uh, the one that the evangelicals uh, are saying is Golgotha. The place of the skull would have been up in this area. So it's debatable which, which direction was which and how it went. But you can visualize it all here. Now, this same model, you know where it is in the US? You can see the same thing called the Bible Land Experience in Orlando, Florida. Yeah. Israeli Museum, uh, best place in the world for uh, biblical timelines in the various cultures that inhabited the land from the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, the Minoans, and so forth. The next day, I mean, this is all one day at the Israel complex. And Dan, it's 20 acres. I mean, uh, show you this. The Bible Land Museum, it costs. No, you uh, they do they do take reservations. I've never been in there. I mean, to me, it's a homeschooler's dream because it's all there to see in a timeline uh, biblically, uh, but it wasn't built when I had my kids there. So I, this is extracurricular as far as the tour is concerned. They'll pay for our admission here, but over here, I think it's $6, $7, it's not much. But it's, uh, from what I understand, it's well worth it. Uh, you can use your credit card, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, from here, this is like the Mall of America, and this is just outside the parking lot. Um, it's all part of the same complex, get to it. It is, it's right, I mean, you're gonna be uh, spending the day here. And if you wanna take longer, do so. Just, uh, it's 2.1 miles to the hotel. You can walk it if you want to, but it's through a, uh, I don't want to say high traffic, but um, it's everything in the old city is difficult, congested, right? Next morning, we get up bright and early and we head to the Jericho Road. Uh, this is the famous road that travels from Bethany, which is on the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley from the Temple Mount all the way down 20 miles to Jericho, descending from 2,200 feet above sea level to 1,500 feet below sea level. It's going east. Um, it is on this road that the Good Samaritan story is set. It is on this road that Mary and Joseph lost Jesus when they had traveled that 20 miles during the day, got to Jericho to camp for the night, found out he wasn't with them, and turned around and had to hike 20 miles the next day back up. So uh, this is that road. This is the road all the pilgrims, good pilgrims of Jewish descent from northern Galilee. And let's look at that from way up here they would travel down the Jordan River Valley with water the whole way, bypassing this entire area. What's that region called in Jesus's day? That's Samaria. This is the region of Samaria right here. And any good Jew would either walk this way and come up and ascend to Jerusalem three times a year, or he would come down 
with his family in many cases down the Jordan River Valley. See that green stripe all the way down? It lasts for about 100 yards on either side of the river. And then you're back into the desolate desolation of the Judean desert. And from Jericho right here, there is a path that snakes up past the monastery of St. George, an aqueduct that ties into a spring right here. And I've had swimming occasions in that spring. It's a beautiful area. I mean, it's just straight up vertical walls like this room with water about 10 foot deep coming directly from underground. Uh, it's cool, it's refreshing, and you're swimming in the monastery's drinking water. <laughs> but the, the aqueduct carries the water all the way down uh, to the monastery. But this is the route the pilgrims would use. Look at Jerusalem up here. It's on a ridge uh, that you can visualize. Bethlehem is on that same ridge about six miles away. Uh, Herodian, where we're going, is right here. That's another mile from Bethlehem. Uh, this ridge line had a route on it called the King's Highway. And the King's Highway literally was at an elevation of 2,200 square, I mean, feet in height, where it was much cooler than either the seacoast or the, uh, the desert. So the King's Highway traveled the hilltops, and you went through Samaria on your way up here, past Mount Tabor and Nazareth and everything else that we already have seen, uh, further into Lebanon and, and whatnot. So look how green that is right there. This whole area is fairly lush, good farmland. Then Jerusalem, crowned by mountain tops and peaks all the way around. Uh, if I forget you, O oh Jerusalem, let my right hand be cut off. Uh, come and let us go into the mountain of the Lord. Uh, the Mount Moriah, they're completely surrounded. And then here's the Mount of Olives. And from the top of the Mount of Olives in Bethany, right here, you can look 20 miles down to the Dead Sea. Now, there's only a look. I don't know if we're going to be able to capture that film-wise uh, because there's just uh, in-between buildings. Uh, and I don't know if we can get the bus there or if there's a pull-off, but we'll try. Try to get get that captured. All the way down to Jericho. Um, Dan mentioned Jericho this morning. Think about the opening game in an opening season, football season, and the coach tells the, the team to show up four hours before the game starts and run around the stadium 12 times. Now, this is the opening game of a, a new season. See the bus right there? It gives you a little bit of scale of what the size of the city of Jer Jericho was like. And to every day, for six days, the priests in procession with the army and the people of Israel marched around it one time. But on the seventh day, the Sabbath, they marched around it seven times before fighting their first actual battle uh, in the promised land. And of course, the Lord collapsed the walls, and, but they still had to scale those broken down walls and physically overcome the people that were in the city of Jericho. Uh, I've got a arrowhead, Israelite arrowhead, from within the destruction layer of that time. It's one of my treasured possessions, um, reminding me all through my life that yes, the Lord is with us, but we still have to shoot the bad guys. You know, there's still work to be done on our end. Um, anybody that hasn't been baptized, this is your opportunity uh, to be baptized. See Dan or Larry uh, in regards to that. Has anybody said anything to you? 
No. Uh, then what you're looking at is Jordan on the right-hand side, Israel on the left. This is the border right here between the two countries and another hundred yards beyond the lush greenery of the Jordan River is the security fences and border patrols and so on and so forth that secure the, the area. Shechem is uh, where we are turning we're going to go up the Jordan Valley just a short ways, maybe a 20 minute drive, past the city where um, uh, Saul and his, what was it? Somebody was nailed to the wall. It was Saul's sons. The descendants of Saul were nailed to one of the walls of the city. And it was because he treated them badly during his lifetime. But the bottom line is we head into Samaria, straight up to the ridge line. And this is where we enter, is Shechem. Anybody know what happened in Shechem? Lots of stories here. The story of Jacob running from his brother, stopping here, having a dream. Bethel, the house of God. He had a dream of angels sending and descending on a ladder. Uh, he left this place after placing a stone of remembrance there. And he headed on up to uh, Ur, you know, the Chaldean city where Lot, his uncle was. I believe it was his uncle. And uh, came back with a full family. He had all of his family here and they were going to settle in the land. And he was negotiating with the people who had built the, the older village of Shechem and they excavated it. You can see it, I didn't have a picture, but uh, the old city has been completely excavated and it's a little mound right around here. Jacob was down below that and that's where he dug a well. And he went 125 feet through solid rock. He and his sons bored the well or drilled it, cut it out by hand. Uh, you, it's where Christ met the woman at the well. That's Jacob's well. Now, this is West Bank territory. We are moving from... Uh, as soon as we pass Bethany, we're entering the West Bank. And we will be traveling through the West Bank all the way during this day. Uh, so this will be the only day that has a question mark by it due to whatever politically is going on on that day. And our guides will know and they'll be up to the latest thing. But generally the well right here is, a, is the number one tourist attraction for Shechem. Modern city's name is Nablus. So this is the uh, woman at the well. And we will be stopping there briefly. That well is what it looked like turn of the century. And that is a Byzantine church that's been built on top of it that they since completely removed most of it. You're still down in the grotto section when you go down to visit the well, but that well is 4,000 years old. They can date it. I mean, this is it. You are there. <laughs> the Lord was somewhere within a six to eight foot radius of where you're going to be standing, and you can envision the whole thing. You pull, and they've got a rope with a bucket there, and they let people take turns cranking the handle to bring the bucket up 125 feet. And then you get a cup and you dump that water into the well and you wait and you wait and you wait. I mean, it's 32 feet a second per second, right? How long does it take to fall 125 feet? Three seconds? It's a long time. But when you hear it splash at the bottom. So this is that. And you're going to be there, Lord willing, 
you know, and be able to envision that and see it. Not two miles away from that well is another major event from 1 Samuel 17, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Gerizim's on the left, Ebal's on the right. What happened here? Remember the curses and the blessings? This, I mean, Jericho had just happened. They're now entering the land. AI is next. But after AI, they come here. And they are told, and all Israel, sojourner as well as native born, with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that was written in the book of the law, the blessings and the curses. This is what you will get if you obey the law of the Lord. These are the curses that will come upon you if you don't. And this is what Joshua was instructed to do as they entered the land. When I was talking to Ken Rutherford about going on this trip, and I said, are there any particular places you want to see? Mount Evil and Mount Gerizim. That's my, that's my bucket list of all the places that I, this was it for him. A few miles away, half, half an hour ride, we're going to be going to Shiloh. Uh, this is so far down in the weeds that people don't realize the difference between the book of Judges and the time of the Judges and the time of the Kings. Two completely theologically separated periods of time, both about 400 years in length. When we talk about the book of Judges, nobody thinks about it in the time frame of lasting as long as the kings of Israel, first and second kings, first and second chronicles. We have so much more material, but the time of the judges from Joshua and his generation to Saul becoming the first king of Israel was 369 years. And God did not want them choosing a king. He did not. He told them that through Samuel. He's, and they said, but we want somebody to lead us into battle. We want somebody to represent us uh, before the nations and so on and so forth. And God said, I want to be your king. But they, they wanted a king. So he gave them a king. But for the first 369 years, whenever they got in trouble, they turned to the Lord, and he sent a judge to deliver them and restore uh, the kingship to God. In other words, it was a theocracy. He wanted a theocracy, not a monarchy. And there are certain things that came with a monarchy that produced bad fruit uh, over time. But it's understandable why they did not want God as their king. Um, because it required certain things from the law that they had to do. Now, Shiloh was the spiritual center of the judges for 369 years, because this is where the tabernacle sat. The tabernacle that Moses made in the wilderness sat here at Shiloh on the land that you see in front of you. Now, envision the tribes of Israel. I mean, you get there, and it's like it's in a bowl, down in a bowl. And the tribes of Israel encamped on the hillsides, looking down on the tabernacle. And the, where the Ark of the Covenant was, all of the sacrificial um, offerings, we're going there. And it's an evangelical group that's excavating. There's an ongoing excavation here. They've been doing it for the past 10 years. It's amazing what they've found. And right over here in this area, 
you can, they're digging them up daily, the bones of the sacrificial animals themselves. Uh, you know, the sheep, the uh, cattle, and so forth. Or, and it's all the right-hand side of the animal. Why is that? They find no left-hand sides in the bones. Go back to your Old Testament law. How did the priests get paid for their service? They had the meat from the sacrificial offerings in certain cases. There were some sacrificial offerings they weren't allowed to eat from, but most of them they were. And um, it was Samuel's or Eli's sons that were taking the choicest portions and things that they weren't supposed to be taking. Anyway, all of that is going on right here. And this was the spiritual heart of Israel for quite a while. It was uh, halfway from the north and halfway from the south. So it was mid-distance so that no one tribe had a lock on coming to meet before the Lord. And this is um, significant in Israel's history. But right now it's in the heart of the West Bank and it's difficult sometimes to get to. Uh, what you see up above is where the Israelis have made settlements illegally in, in many cases. They just literally took a bulldozer, arrived one day, flattened the hilltops and started building houses and schools and whatnot on the West Bank property. And of course, that's what the Palestinians are objecting to, is the illegal settlements that are coming in everywhere and taking over the land. And that's, Israel is unashamed. There's the settler movement that their aim is to displace or to fill all of the empty places that the uh, Palestinians aren't. Now, they captured the West Bank in 67 and took over jurisdiction of it, ultimately. They gave some autonomy back to the Palestinian people, which is why when we go to Herodian, Bethlehem, Jericho, Shiloh, what you're looking at is a Palestinian-run site. It's the Palestinian authority that, that runs the place. Uh, because you're literally in their territory, the West Bank. Um, we're going to see it in Zedekiah's caverns, but they don't care anything for Jewish history. Anything that validates Jewish history, they don't want to dig up. They don't want to validate. Uh, they want to hide or obscure. Uh, it's very clear that they're doing that on the Temple Mount. Um, where they just come in with bulldozers and tear up the Temple Mount, regardless of the archaeological treasures that are located in that. And the group last time we went sifted through that garbage that the Palestinians dumped in the city dump to find pottery shards. They find seals. What else did... <laughs> okay. Uh, all kinds of things, yeah. All right, from Shiloh, we go back into Jerusalem, Gloria Hotel. Uh, depending on what time it is, uh, this is now, say the 30th is a, 28th is a Tuesday, 29th, Wednesday, this is Thursday. I got to be careful because you've got to mark your Sabbath. When does Sabbath, Jewish Sabbath, begin? On what day? Friday evening. So watch where you are on Friday evening. You've got basically a, some free time and just be, I mean, everything's going to close down and you're going to see lights, candle lights lighting up all over the Jewish section of Jerusalem as they uh, worship. Uh, Wailing Wall is an interesting place to be and see them gathering there. 
we are going into the West Bank. Signs up that say to Jewish travel guides, enter at your own risk. Your life may be the cost. In other words, we are not vouching for you if you come because Jews are not allowed in the West Bank without permission and so on and so forth. What you're looking at is the shepherd's fields, a view from Jerusalem towards the Judean desert um, to Bethlehem. You can visualize the star above Bethlehem that the shepherds saw by night. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be traveling to Bethlehem, but we're not going to be stopping in it for very good reasons. Number one, this is the church um, Nativity Square, the Church of the Nativity, and it is a Catholic Byzantine affair. Long lines, buses everywhere, uh, and you wait for a long time to get inside to where the grotto is, and you can see the traffic in these narrow streets. See where the yellow taxis are? That's the uh, Bethlehem Hotel. I lived there for the better part of a month when I was excavating uh, and working down in Qumran. So I'd walk down to the village, I mean, the Bethlehem Square all the time and talk with the various Christian Palestinian shop owners who were great. They were great. In 1948, the religious makeup of the city was 85% Christian. Today it's less than 10. I'd say it's less than that now. Um, I know all the people I knew have moved. They've left. They are no longer there, scattered around the world. You wait in line, and this is what you'll see in the grotto. It's a silver star with a grotto down below it, and it will have a slight glistening hue, moist hue from where the pilgrims have kissed it. Uh, and it's just, it's nasty. So, we're not going there, okay? That I'm, unless you want to go on your free time, wait through the line and do all of that. Uh, we're going to take you someplace that's probably much more authentic. Uh, near the old YMCA, there's a limestone cave, not too shallow, but you could shelter in it. And people have been sheltering in it for thousands of years. And it's ideal right there in Bethlehem on the outskirts where the animals, a manger, everything can be visualized. And it's probably much more like that than this site here. Um, we leave, it's to revere and venerate. The grotto where Jesus was born is supposedly right below it. Uh, well, yeah. an icon, yeah. Right. On our way to Herodian. Herodian is the tomb of Herod, but more importantly, it was meant to be. That is now debatable. Um, they said they found Herod's tomb, and Professor Netzer of Hebrew University announced that a couple decades ago, and it made world news. I mean, it was a big deal because they'd been looking for Herod's tomb for forever and hadn't found it. And they just assumed it was buried somewhere. He was buried somewhere in this man-made hill, mountain, man-made, bucket at a time. 225 feet of soil moved by human labor to build this mountain that a palace was built on top of. Herod was so paranoid because he killed so many people, uh, including his own children. Five days before his death, he uh, had his son Antipater murdered. <laughs> and leading Herod to say it'd be better to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his children, because um, he killed so many of them, he murdered them. Uh, 
he was dying. He was within five days of death. And he gave the order that all the noblemen in Israel were to be locked up and killed on the day of his death so that all Israel would mourn on that day. Well, he died and they were all let out of prison and the country rejoiced. <laughs> Ding dong, the witch is dead, <laughs> you know, type of thing. Um, so where is he? That, that was the question. You see the parking lot here. This is a gift shop. This is all steps that ascend past the ticket kiosk uh, all the way up to the top here where you get to walk through the ruins of his palace. Now, we knew at the time that I went with my kids that this whole thing had underground hollow places all through it because the archeologist had been poking around underneath in the dark places and the kind of like uh, Kazid Doom, you use the uh, illustration, but it's deep, dark pits of all kinds down here. There you go, that's what I was looking for. Well, um, I got there with my five, kids and my wife and we walked up here and we got to the ticket kiosk and I said could I have the key please and the guy without batting an eye reached under the thing pulled out a big honking iron key about like that and he said bring it back when you're done and be sure the door is locked I said yes sir my wife's eyes were that big she said, what are you doing? I said, just trust me. <laughs> we walked down here, uh, down this side path, and there's a door down here at the base of the mountain that the archaeology teams had been using to access the interior of the, of the structure. And I opened that thing up, and I told the kids, I said, get out your flashlights, stay close. Hold on to grandpa, 81 year old grandpa was with us. He loved it. And we went underground, right into the mines of Mariah, so to speak. And uh, it, sure enough, there were piles of rubble everywhere. There were pits that you couldn't see the bottom of. Uh, it was a little more than I was anticipating. And my wife says, really? <laughs> that was, yeah. I said, yeah, it's okay. May not have been my, my best day, but uh, we wound our way up to the top. And when we got up to the top, I mean, here's the path that led down to the base. And we had wound our way up through the top. They've dug it out now, but we came in underground and we came out of a, a doorway jail it looked like a jail because it was a big iron door with bars on it and I reached around stuck the key in twisted it to let us out and there was ooing and aahing from a thousand Japanese tourists who <laughs> and my sons proudly strutted out from underneath you know the mountain uh, and all my points with them went way up. My wife just rolled her eyes. You know, <laughs> it was that kind of thing. But yeah, uh, she said, how'd you know about that? I said, I read an article. <laughs> Ask for the key. No, no anything. They don't do that now. That, that doesn't work. And I've tried it in Zedekiah's caverns. But they did find what was supposedly Herod's tomb. Uh, this was a sarcophagus, one of two that they found. And he, everybody agrees it's probably uh, Herod's wife and maybe his aunt. It's not Herod himself. They never could find Herod's tomb per se, but they found where it could be enclosed. So the crowds that came along in 70 AD rebelling against the Romans, 69 AD, probably wiped 
any vestige of him completely clean. But interestingly enough, there are two archaeologists, one of which I know personally. Josie Patrick was the archaeologist I worked for down at the Dead Sea in Qumran. And he's one of two archaeologists that are questioning the status quo that this was where Herod was buried. They believe he was buried somewhere else and that his tomb hadn't been found because it was pretty wimpy. You know, you build a mountain, a huge mountain like that, and you don't have a little room in it where you put your remains. December 1st is a free day. And uh, I've sent you some suggestions about places that you might want to check out, see, some of which require advanced booking. The Temple Institute is one of them we'll get to in a second. And the underground Wailing Wall is another one. Um, has anybody been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C.? I've taken two groups of grandkids, teenage grandkids. The uh, sobering experience uh, to see the impact of fascism on humanity and as it was practiced against the Jews during Nazi Germany. Uh, communism, it's as bad in under Stalin, if not worse. But man's inhumanity to man is a constant reminder. And until they begin building one in Europe and one in Washington, DC, this was the only place you can go that documented that history. And I took my kids and made sure that they've been there. And I've taken my grandkids to DC uh, to let them go through that. By the way, if you're ever in D.C., the best museum, forget the Smithsonian, go to the Bible Museum. Hobby Lobby uh, sponsored the building of that recently. Fantastic. Absolutely unparalleled from a Christian evangelical view and well worth every, every minute spent. So it's worth a trip in and of itself. Zedekiah's cave or cavern. Now we're going to be going through Hezekiah's cat, you know, uh, tunnel. We're going to be under the streets of Jerusalem, walking up Cheesemakers Valley. We're going to be uh, there are various and sundry places that you can go under the Western Wall and the tour to see remarkable things. Um, I said there is one stone block that's bigger than this back wall. Height, length is as long as a semi-trailer truck. Uh, and it's just incredible how they were able to place that. But you'll see uh, what uh, ostensibly was an attempt to burrow under the Holy of Holies on the Temple Mount. Where Solomon's Temple was is where the Mosque of Omar is right now, the Dome of the Rock. And when you go in the Dome of the Rock, and you can go in, or at least they used to let you go in, uh, you see a rock. It's the threshing floor of Aruna. And down underneath of it are chambers. And what's down underneath those chambers? Well, that's where the Ark of the Covenant stood in Solomon's, I mean, in Herod's temple. And the Jewish rabbis believe that they could tunnel under the Temple Mount Wailing Wall, underneath this block, and approach the Holy of Holies because they believe the Ark is squirreled away in there somewhere. You ran, you've probably read enough Dan Brown books and other things to get the, the storyline, but the bottom line is they're either looking for the Ark of the Covenant uh, or any vestige of the uh, temple period, uh, which is probably long gone. But Zedekiah's cavern uh, was probably where Zedekiah escaped the Babylonian army that was completely encircled around the old city of Jerusalem. Babylonians had completely encircled. There was no way out. Zedekiah was in a heap of trouble because he didn't surrender. And there was a secret bolt hole, a passageway from his garden, we're told, 
through the king's garden, through the gate between the gates, and out into the Judean desert, running and connecting to the uh, uh, Jericho Road. And that's where he fled when he fled in the middle of the night through this bolt hole and out. And you see it right here from a century ago or 80 years or so. One of the British officers was walking his dog and there was imagined rubble almost all the way up to the top of that gated opening. And that's where his dog chased a fox into the hole and didn't come out for 10 minutes. He could hear the barking and it was echoing. And he thought, all right, this bears some ex exploration. This is in the 1880s or 90s. And he brought his two boys back with him with lanterns the next day. And they crawled on their belly through that opening that the dog went through. And it just opened up completely before them. I mean, there are caverns in here uh, that you could park a 747 in. They're that big. And th these were the quarries underneath the temple, not the temple mount, moving directly towards the temple mount uh, that they used to build buildings in Jerusalem, probably during Herod's time, which included the temple complex because the stone is the same stone. The base of the Wailing Wall and this stone is the same. Uh, so this is probably Herod's quarries, although it's called Solomon's quarries. And I think archeologically there is no basis at all. And I think everybody agrees that it's not Solomon's quarries, but it could be Herod's. But it's likely the place where Zedekiah escaped. It keeps dropping. You you go in, you got high ceilings, you won't be claustrophobic if you have a problem being underground. And you just keep descending down, 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 longer than a football field. And once you get down to the bottom, you think you're way underground. Well, no, the ground up above as you've been paralleling it 30 feet below the surface. And there are um, all kinds of palace. This is the Palestinian quarter. So it's not the Jewish quarter, it's not the Christian quarter, whatnot. These are all Palestinian shops up above. And here are the steps leading down. You see uh, Zedekiah's tears down here. It's a waterfall, small waterfall uh, of spring water underground, uh, like the Gion Spring, but it's down underground that you can see called Zedekiah's Tears. Uh, you keep coming down here and, and you notice this says Freemasons Hall. What in the world? That's my reaction when I got down here and read the plaque down at the bottom. Did some research on it later on. You know, the Freemasons believe that their founder was Solomon and that this was Solomon's quarries. So this got to be somehow connected to the free, whole Freemasonry thing. So the high ups, and that's a question of how high, uh, once a year, they book this entire section of the cavern. And this is where you can put a 747 and they hold their most sacred right, whatever that is. Um, but there's a plaque down there and I got to thinking about it, right down in this corner down here, another 50 feet that way, is the Temple Mount, the beginning of the Temple Plaza uh, that Herod built. And so this whole area, series of caverns, are moving in darkness towards the Temple Mount. And this place right here is the closest you can be to the Holy of Holies and still be in total darkness, total blackness. And I, don't, I, I think it's symbolic, spiritually speaking, but everything over here that you see in all these dots is closed off to the public. Now, if you followed the link that I sent you, 
on Zedekiah's caverns and you watched it, you watched the archaeologist and the guy drop into a hole. I knew about that hole from uh, Indy Jones. I mean, we knew all the secrets of everything because uh, he wanted, uh, wanted us to stick our nose in it. We were, uh, four of us decided to take him up on the offer to go check it out. And Spelunk in all of this, this section of the cavern. And you see the, in the video, the guy dropping through the hole. Well, I took my family, my wife didn't go, and neither did my oldest daughter. For some reason, they were wiser <laughs> after the whole Herodian thing. And uh, we went down in it, and I took them all back through here, uh, weaving in and out the wall between, the gate between the, the gates is right here. And it's a crenellated wall that archeologically was not from the time of Zedekiah, but from the Crusaders. The Crusaders had put a bolt hole in the same place Zedekiah had for the same reason, in case the Muslims encircled them, they wanted a way out. And they built a literal fortress wall down underground uh, in the cavern itself, floor to ceiling with the, you know, the windows that slope for shooting arrows and so on and so forth. It's all down there. Uh, but the Palestinians have no desire to open this up. I mean, I back in here, underneath the Palestinian shops, there are holes in the floor of uh, the ceiling of the cave covered over with metal uh, so that nothing falls in. But down below the opening is a cone of trash 30 feet high. I mean, we're talking old baby carriages, tricycles, bicycle parts, uh, cans, open cans of garbage going back 20 years. I mean, it was just dumped in the hole. And somebody, the, probably the Israeli authority, came and closed it all because they were afraid of them being used as Palestinian hidey holes for weaponry and everything else. We were told at the time that there was a series of caves that connected 20 miles underground all the way to the Dead Sea uh, because it's a limestone structure. It made sense. There have been spelunking uh, people that went down there and were killed by the poisonous fumes that we didn't carry a canary with us. We weren't too smart, um, but we did uh, explore that whole region and it's uh, Interesting that the Palestinians have not let the archaeologists publish anything that they've found down in that area. Uh, if you go to the thing, they drop down in the hole, they come out of the hole, and they never show you anything in the hole. And that's, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of things down in there that were fascinating. All kinds of pilgrim. You look on the ceiling as you're walking down from up here. Everywhere you walk, the ceiling is covered in pilgrims' names going back to the 1600s or the 1200s or the whatnot. There, it's just where pilgrims have been for forever. So. Temple Institute. Uh, you have to book this, but there is a movement among the Jews, and I mentioned it before, of reinstating the priesthood and temple worship. The third temple is actively being sought. And they are about 12 months away from a minimum required time for the ashes of the red heifer to be produced in order to consecrate these priests who are being trained in their duties as we speak. So you can go to the Temple Institute. You can see there they've made all of the utensils for for worship and sacrifice. Uh, every All the clothing has been made. They've made, uh, I don't know if that's the laver or if that's the altar of incense, probably the laver where they clean their hands. Um, but they've recreated all of the temple furniture, including the Ark of the Covenant. Now, does anything look odd about 
this rendition of the Ark of the Covenant? How about the uh, poles? They're on the wrong side, or are they on the right side? But they're it traditionally are our images that you put poles down lengthwise. Having been in the business of moving architectural millwork of this size and weight now. The top of that is solid gold. There's 250 pounds of gold on this thing. The center of gravity, if number one, you always see these uh, poles down at the feet, down at the bottom level on the four corners. That's a big no-no. Just a slight stumble and your center of gravity gets tilted and the whole thing tumbles. Um, when you put them out this way, you counter that because you can get two guys on the pole and they're not in the same plane per se. And you, you, if you're carrying in the, on open ground and you, somebody stumbles, somebody else is there to recover and so on and so forth. If you do it the other way, you're in sequence or series and there's no way you can overcome the stumbling of that one guy in front of you or behind you. It's just leverage and physics. But more importantly, it's biblical. It's as simple as can be. The, the poles stuck out of the Holy of Holies through the, the curtain. Uh, it says that very clearly. How do you get the poles to stick out through the curtain from the Holy of Holies into the holy place? Unless they're pointed in this direction because we know the orientation of the ark had to be from wall to wall like that. But the cherubim, if Solomon's cherubim came from the wall over these cherubim, there were two sets of cherubim with their wingtips touching. So um, in looking at all of that, there are all kinds of parallels to salvation, to Christ as our mediator and sacrifice. If you ever do a study of the tabernacle, it is well worth your time to go back like the 66 elements of the candlestick that we looked at that represent the thy word is light. Um, this is some of the things that you're going to see. Now, the last thing is the uh, tour underneath the Western Wall. And there are two tours, so be careful if you go and book something that you book the one you want to go on. One of them highlights the Roman archaeological uh, items that they found, including a small amphitheater. The other goes underneath the Wailing Wall's foundations and goes to where the rabbis tried to bore a hole to the Holy of Holies. Excuse me, they've got that all blocked up solid now. And that's your free day. So plan ahead, plan what you're going to see, plan what you want to see at the Israel Museum, because that is well worth planning ahead, because you can't see it all. It's like the Louvre in Paris, if you've been there. You've just got to plan what you what's important to you. You can look up some of the archaeological artifacts that they have there that tie to biblical stories, and that would be a good place to start. And then on the second, uh, not at all 3 a.m. in the morning, but at a decent time, I think we leave at 11.30, uh, somewhere around there. So we get up at 7, have breakfast, leisurely make the trip to the airport, and get home that afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Uh, I forget what the landing time is, but it's late afternoon, I believe it is. Any questions on any of this? No. Separate. The Wailing Wall, I sent you a link a week ago, uh, so that you can.
Well, it took you to the the site and you have to go around the site because you have to choose which tour you want to go on. They have two. And what, if, time. And, and what time you want to go and so on and so forth. It's your free day, so you're free to do whatever you want. Everything on your free day is between Zedekiah's Caverns, uh, the Garden Tomb, if you want to visit that again, uh, all of these tours that we're talking about, they're all within a uh, half a mile. Without a wife at that time, too. Yeah. yeah. But um, any other places you'd recommend? By the way, that was not Absalom's tomb down there. They call it Absalom's tomb, but it was Crusader time frame. Pool of Siloam. That's part of the tour that we're going to do. Um, uh, once again, anybody that wants to take a wants to skip part of it, let me know. And that was that may have you been up that route since they opened it from the Pool of Siloam all the way underground. It, Yep. Um, do we need to have a meeting as we get closer to the time? If you have a Bible story or an event that is special to you that you want to see, we're probably going to be at least passing by it. If you know, um, I'm meeting, I'm meeting with the actual guide and driver every morning or the evening before to plan out our day based on weather, based on politics, based on all of the above. So let me know if you have anything special that you want to see. And yeah, be sure. And one thing you realize is that this is a journey. It's not really out there. Right? It's not really out Speaking of money, uh, I do want to mention that tips at the hotel and the restaurants are included in our tour price. 
So that's what they mean when they say tips included. What's not included and is expected is a tip at the end of the tour for the driver and the guide, okay? Uh, use a rule of thumb. What does it mean to you? What's the experience been for you? Um, we're gonna be taking up a love offering at the end of the trip and handing it to them. Uh, and the tour company provides us with the envelopes. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, that we want to allow for. And after you spend two weeks with a guide and a driver, you, you feel a camaraderie with them. And depending on how much they bend to your agenda, uh, that's my level of appreciation is giving us our top-notch experience, cramming in every ounce of opportunity uh, to do whatever you're wanting to do. So let us know. All right. We'll uh, notify you and probably have a get together. Elena from Florida is wanting to come up here and meet everybody before she goes. So we'll probably have some kind of get together to talk about packing and answer any questions at the end there. If you haven't got your passport information in, get it in. We, we do need that. All right. See you later. Thank you, Dan. Oh, hey, Elena. Hi. <laughs> Were you able to see the slides this time? I, I, I did. Everything was perfect. Okay, great. I might be calling you soon. <laughs> Please do. Please All right, do. I will. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. We'll see you. All right, bye.